that you're here. If you're visiting for, with us for the very first time, we're, we're glad that you chose to be here today. And uh, we hope that on your way in, you received one of those yellow connect cards. And if you did get a card, uh, would you fill that card out? And then at the end of the service, return it at the Welcome Center uh, as you leave. And uh, we have a gift for you for being with us today. And if this is more than your first, uh, first time, we're glad that you're back. And we know that there are many places you can be, and we're glad that you're here with us today. Now let's continue to prepare our hearts for what God has for us. And uh, every time we come together, there's always something that he has for us to, uh, to decide. And I uh, pray that uh, you'll be thinking about that today as we uh, worship and as we sing and as we prepare for the message. Thank you.
Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Father, we're grateful for this uh, time that we have this morning in your house. Thank you, Father, for uh, the, uh, the image that we have of you standing ready to receive us as a father waits for his prodigal. 
Father, we know, God, that you stand ready with arms open wide, and all you want us to do is come running to you, understanding that we've, uh, we're sinners and we're in need of uh, being saved and forgiven. I pray, God, that uh, we would uh, be grateful and uh, remember the times when we've been delivered from uh, being uh, a slave to our bo uh, being in bondage. And I pray, God, that we would uh, just know that there's nothing in our lives that uh, we cannot confess, admit to, and be forgiven for. And I just thank you, Father, for the promise that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. I pray, God, that uh, you'd be with us now. Speak to our hearts. Help us, Father, to be attentive to your word. I pray for Pastor Stan as he brings your word, that you would just anoint him, that you'd use him in a mighty way to uh, tell us uh, your truth in, in your word and that we would make application to our lives. Thank you for what you're going to do. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
grateful today that he takes us just as we are. And do you know, each of you, each of us, has a kingdom. Anything that we put above or before the Lord in our lives is a kingdom. And if you're like I am, we try every day to walk away from the kingdoms in our lives and focus completely on the Lord. And I know that that's hard. And it's an everyday battle. But I also know that that battle belongs to the Lord. And even sometimes when I forget that, he reminds me. But every day, I have to give that battle to him and let it go and put it down and let him have that power over me. Oh, oh. 
to be. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kathy, for that uh, reminder. Maybe some of you have been watching some of the uh, insight on the trial of this guy in South Carolina, Murdoch, I think is his name. He's confessed that he's a, a liar, lied about a lot of things, and now he's trying to prove that he didn't kill his wife and his son. You know, it's hard to believe a liar, it really is. We live in a world today that accepts lying as a way of life. This was the conclusion of a man who worked with some college students recently. He went on to say, it is a non-issue all too often. The truth of the matter, he said, it seems is that everyone lies, and they lie all the time. It's almost as if it is not a sin anymore to lie. This certainly seems to be a fulfillment of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, chapter 3 and verse 13. He said, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. After discussing how people routinely lie to cover up their sin, he offered this conclusion. You can't help a liar. You can help anyone struggling with any sort of sin as long as they tell the truth. But you can't help a liar because you can't trust anything he says. This morning, I want to speak to you about true repentance. True repentance is not, I'm sorry, I got caught. <laughs> true repentance involves coming clean, which means admitting to the whole wrongdoing. The Bible tells us that God desires truth in the inward parts. Or as Eugene Peterson puts it in the message, truth from the inside out. It's very hard for us to come to this place of total honesty with God and with others. If we are honest, it is an ongoing battle to be transparent in all of our dealings. To excuse ourselves in this crazy age in which we live, we use that famous cliche, everyone does it, so that must make it right. Although we live in a society that encourages us to make excuses, most of us don't need any encouragement. We're born knowing how to pass the buck. So our problem goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Sin had changed everything. There was such a relationship that Adam and Eve had with God. They spoke with him in the evenings. They enjoyed their time with God. They talked with God freely. And now we find them hiding themselves, lest their sin be discovered. The conclusion is, we are born knowing how to pass the bug. 
I didn't do it. It was their fault. Children learn that at a very early age. When Adam was cornered by God, Adam did what man usually does. He passes the buck. His answer is a classic form of evasion. The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Actually, Adam passed the buck twice. Not only did he blame Eve, but he blamed God. Perhaps the dialogue with God went something like this. Lord, it was her fault. She gave me the fruit, so I ate it. What was I supposed to do? Say no and watch her pout all night? <laughs> and anyway, who put her in the garden? You did. She wasn't my idea. Now, I'm not complaining, Lord, because she's beautiful and cute and all that. But I didn't have this problem when it was just me and the animals. Well, we laugh at that, but we're just like Adam. We pass the buck. The Bible is telling us something significant here. It is in our nature to deny our guilt and to try and shift the blame to others. In the early 70s, you might remember a guy by the name of Flip Wilson. He popularized the phrase, the devil made me do it. Well, the truth of the matter is this, that the devil never makes us do anything. He doesn't do that. He doesn't hold a gun to our head and say, you do it or I'm going to shoot you. He doesn't do that. What we do is a result of the free will that God has given to each one of us. In the thousands of years since the Garden of Eden, nothing has really changed. Human nature is the same. Passing the buck is in our spiritual bloodstream. We do it now because Adam did it back then. He established the pattern. So how does that pattern go anyway? Well, it begins with disobedience. God told Adam and Eve, you can eat of everything that's in this garden. Everything that you need is here, but you can't touch this tree. For the day in which you do that, you shall surely die. Well, they didn't believe God. And then the devil comes along and uh, encourages them to go against what God says. So disobedience. And so that leads then to guilt. And then guilt leads to shame, which leads to fear, which leads to hiding, which leads to blaming others. We might be reminded this morning of what King Solomon said in Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. So we have two options when we sin. Option number one is to conceal it, to cover it up, to make excuses, pass the buck. And as a result, live with a guilty conscience. When the psalmist wrote in Psalm 32 and verse 3, he said, When I kept silence about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. So we do have that option. It's not a good option, but we have it. And unfortunately, most people, even believers, take that option all too often. Then there's option number two. We can confess our sins and renounce them. We must own up to what we did, what took place. Sometimes we might need to take a piece of paper and write down all of those things. All of those things that we've 
thrown under the rug, all of those things that we have dismissed in our own life, but God hasn't. We need to own up. Yes, I did it, and I know it was wrong. To renounce your sin means to take steps to break the destructive patterns in your life. It means saying, I've been walking in the wrong path, and now with God's help, I'm not going to walk that path anymore. I'm going to change the direction of my life. We call that repentance. It is coming to acknowledge I was wrong, I have sinned, I have broken the heart of my father, and now I'm going to turn. I renounce those sins. I'm going to turn, and I'm going to walk in a new direction. The problem with many is they might confess their sins, but they never turn from them. There must be a turning away in order to know true repentance. So here comes those three hard words. I was wrong. It's not easy to say those words, is it? Most of us would rather do anything than to admit that we're wrong. We might choose to say, that was not right. But not right is not the same as wrong. If you're wrong, you're wrong. But if you're not right, no one really knows what you really are. We have to use those words. I was wrong. This son, in the wonderful parable of the prodigal, said, I have sinned. I have gone against my father. He admitted his wrong. You see, if we don't admit that we're wrong, we end up passing the buck. And as long as we do that, there is no forgiveness. As long as we do that, we'll remain locked out of the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. As long as you blame others, your life will remain broken and fragmented. You'll never know holiness. You'll never know wholeness or mental and spiritual health. Three hard words. I was wrong. Oh, men fight not to say that. Men and women fight not to admit wrong. We fight not to admit that we have sinned and gone against the things of the Lord. So we find these words in the 21st verse of chapter 15 of Luke. The son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. I have sinned against you. And in thy sight, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. I believe this is a parable of your life and mine many times. When we have sinned, we are so ashamed to find ourselves in the pig pen that we dare not tell anyone where we are. So we try to clean ourselves up to make ourselves presentable. We brush our teeth and comb our hair, but still we have pig slop under our fingernails, you see. People know where we've been. This story is for everyone who is tired of eating with the pigs. You see, when you're ready to go home, when you're ready to address the Father, when you're ready to meet him face to face, there's good news that can come out of that. We find this Father 
standing in the road, waiting for his son. His arms wide open, not to condemn him for where he's been, not to remind him this didn't have to be that way, but no, just to receive him, to love on him, and to celebrate his home going. Well, you know what? The Father is standing in the road waiting for you and for me. Arms wide open. He knows where you've been and he's still waiting for you. The only thing that matters is for you to come home. And that will never happen until you have addressed those three hard words. That's what the grace of God is all about. You can come home. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That no matter what we've done, when we confess it, when we renounce it, and we turn back to the Father, we can always come home. You can start over. You can be forgiven. The slate can be wiped clean. You don't have to live the rest of your life in hiding. You don't have to live in fear that someone will find you out. You don't have to eat with the pigs forever. I like what the message says, 1 John 1, 9. If we admit our sins, simply come clean about them, he won't let us down. He'll be true to himself. He'll forgive our sins and purge us of all wrongdoing. It is possible, and it depends on one thing. You have to do what the prodigal son did. You have to come to your senses and say, Father, I have sinned. And when you do this, you find the mercy that Proverbs 28, 13 talks about. When you do that, you will discover 1 John 1, 9 is true. He is faithful. He is just. He will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He will forgive your sin. You can count on it because it's a promise. So these three hard words can change your life today. You see, until you come clean, you cannot be forgiven. Understand what that means. It means being truthful with God. It means not beating around the bush. It means not passing the buck. It means coming clean with God. It means seeing him face to face and saying to him, Lord, I was wrong. I have sinned. And now I'm confessing that sin. And not only do I want to confess that sin, I want to turn from it. I need your help to do that. I renounce that sin in my life. And you repent. Listen very carefully. As long as you live in a way that is unforgiven, you can never be forgiven. Understand what that means. It means it is your refusal to admit these three hard words to the Father. Oh, I know it's hard. It's hard to say that we were wrong. Listen, we, we do wrong things to people all the time. Sometimes we snub them. Sometimes we speak ill of them. Sometimes we don't address them properly. And we think that's okay. But... It's not okay, not among the family of God. It's not okay. And those things need to be taken care of. You see, as long as we try to pass the buck, then we're no more than a liar. We're saying, I'm not responsible. It's your fault for what I do. No, what we do is our fault. 
We can't blame it on anyone else. We certainly can't blame it on God. So we need to be truthful. It's a terrible thing not to be forgiven. Your refusal to own up to your sin means you will live with the burden of your sin. Do you know what the burden of sin is? You shouldn't have to think long about that. For we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. So we all know the burden of sin in our lives. Now we would like to sweep it under the rug. We would like to blame it on somebody else. We might even be like Adam in the garden and say it was your fault, God. But it's not his fault. You see, he has given to us every reason to be relieved of the burden of sin. And that is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's some questions we have to ask ourselves this morning. Would you like to be forgiven? Well, you see, in order to answer that question, you have to do some introspect. You have to say, well, what is it, God, that I need to be forgiven for? Now, if you ask God, he'll let you know. He'll let you know. Some of those things that you've put down deep in your heart... Some of those things that you've swept under the rug, you just ask God. God, reveal to me that which I need to confess to you and turn from. And if you really mean that, he'll reveal them to you. Now, you might not like what he reveals. But the great news is this, that he will rid you of that burden when you give it to him. So, would you like to be forgiven? Would you like to see the power of the Holy Spirit released in your life? You see, when we have unforgiven sin in our lives, we can't know the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, there's a barrier there between you and what he wants to do in your life. You see, it's not that you lose your salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that you lose your time with God. You lose your fellowship with him. And sometimes being out of fellowship long enough, people get used to that. While there's hordes of them across our nation, that since the pandemic have not addressed a single pew in a single church. They seem to be satisfied with where they are. Maybe they weren't saved to begin with. But maybe they've tried to blame everything that's going on in their lives on somebody else. And therefore they stay away. God wants us to know his power. In our Sunday school lesson this morning in our class, we talked about the Apostle Paul as he addressed the church at Corinth. And he says, I glory in my infirmities. Thank you, God, for all of these things that you bring in my life because it's through them that I recognize my weakness but it's also through them that I recognize your strength. When I am weak, I am made strong. And when we recognize the sin in our lives, when we confess that sin, when we turn from that sin, when we truly repent of that sin, we are forgiven. We're forgiven. And we're able to know the power 
of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So would you like to be forgiven this morning? Would you like to see the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Would you like to see God do something miraculous in the relationships that matter most to you? We all have relationships that may be broken. We may have relationships that are hard to deal with. But may we ask ourselves this question. Are we doing everything that we need to do to bring healing to those relationships? You see, it's easy to point the finger. It's easy to say you're that way because of. Well, we're all that way because of. You know that. See, things that we choose, but we don't have to. We can give them over to the Lord. But we have to be willing to say the hard words that lead to freedom. I was wrong. I have sinned. This story of the prodigal, and we've talked about, talked about him a couple weeks ago, but Listen to these words. When he came to his senses, in the middle of that pig pen, when he realized that, what am I doing here? When I have a father who loves me, a father who cares, he said, I'm going home. And in verse 20, the Bible says, and he arose and came to his father. We can never be forgiven until we arise and come to the father. You see, we can hold on to it. We can sweep it under the rug. We can blame others, pass the buck, but we'll never know forgiveness until we go to the father. Sometimes it takes a lot of gumption to rise up and go to the Father. But look at the rest of this verse. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Now, once again, we might think, you know, the father was just waiting to say those words to him, to be critical you know, I knew you were making a mistake when I gave you your part of the inheritance. I knew that you'd waste it in the world. I knew that you'd wind up like this. And he probably did know that. But so did his son. He didn't need to be told. And so when his father saw him a way off, he had compassion. This is what our Heavenly Father has for us. Compassion when we're ready to come clean with Him. When we're ready to confess that sin that is in our lives that so easily besets us and so easily takes away our, not our relationship, but our fellowship. This boy, not only had he lost everything that his father had given him but he had lost the fellowship that he had with his dad he lost the all of the goodness of being at home all of the blessings that were there and when he rose up and he went that way and his father saw him he had compassion on him and he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Notice who it was that ran. God did. And every time that we confess our sins, every time we say those three hard words, I was wrong, I have sinned, and we repent of those things, God comes running because of his great love for us, because we're his kids, 
and his desire for each of us is to be in the realm of his love and his grace to know the sufficiency of his grace every day. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. And the father could have said, you're right, boy. He didn't say that. He said, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to make merry. Oh wow, oh wow. Do you know that's exactly the scene in heaven when we get right with God, when we use those three hard words and we admit that we're wrong, that we have sinned and we confess those sins and we turn from those sins. There's rejoicing and God comes running to us. Oh, what a joy. What a blessing. So I would ask you again this morning, you want to be forgiven? Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted this Savior that I talk about. This Jesus who went to the cross and shed his blood for the remission of your sin. I would remind you, the Bible says, where there is no shedding of blood, there is no remission. And so Jesus shed his blood for you that you might have forgiveness of your sin, that you can go to the Father. He made the way for you to go to the Father. He is the bridge from mankind to God. There's no other bridge, although we look for other bridges. We look for other ways out, but there is no other way. Only through Jesus, the Christ. Only through him. If we're willing to say those hard words that lead to freedom, you can be saved today. If you've never trusted Jesus as Lord and Savior, he will forgive all of your sin and bring new life to you. Life that you never knew was possible. The relief of the burden of sin and the promise of heaven to come and the power of the indwelling Spirit of God. But maybe you're here today too. You're a believer. You've been a believer a long time, but there's some sin in your life. There's some things that you don't want to admit are wrong, but you need to. Maybe today would be a real good day to take care of that. You don't have to confess that to me. You confess that to the Father through the Son and he will hear you and he will cleanse you and he will make you whole again. He's in that business. But maybe you're here also this morning and you need a place to plant your life to serve the Lord together I believe that it is the will of God for believers to be part of a church family. I just believe that. I think it's scriptural. I think we see it all through the New Testament. You know, Jesus talked about the importance of the church. And I believe folks need to be a part of a local church where they can plant their lives in service to the Lord so that we can work together even till he comes. So whatever it is you need to do today, the Father waits 
just like the prodigal's father. He waits with his arms open wide and he sees us down the, dro- down the road and he is ready to run to you this morning if you're willing to come home. See, it's up to you. It's a decision you must make. But to know the fulfillment of Christ in your life, you got to get rid of the sin. you got to admit, I was wrong. And so, Father, I'm coming to you this morning. Father, we thank you today for the sufficiency of your grace. We thank you today, Father, that your promise is to forgive us when we truly come to you and we come clean. When we no longer try to pass the buck, when we no longer try to blame others, but we look at ourselves squarely in the mirror of your word and we see where we are wrong, where we have sinned, and we need to take the necessary steps getting right with you. Lord, whatever you want to do among us this morning, we ask you to do that. We pray that the Spirit of God would work freely in hearts. And Lord, decisions that need to be made today, that they would be made today. Lord, not to be put off to another day. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time, your word says. And there's never better than a time right now to make other decisions concerning our relationship and our walk with you. So Lord, we pray that you'd be in charge in these moments of invitation and that you would draw us to yourself. And we'll thank you for the results. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation. This morning, if there's a decision you need to make and you need to make it openly, we invite you to come. You meet me right here at the front. The altar is always open if you need to just come and pray. Would you come now as we sing?